If you had told me in 1983 that in the future Boba Fett would get his own TV show, I would have said, that's going to be awesome. But it wasn't awesome. If you had also told me they're going to do a show about Obi-Wan Kenobi when he was younger, I would have said, that's going to be awesome. But it wasn't awesome. And before you say, well, that's because Disney messes up everything Star Wars, well, they do mess up a lot. Somehow Palpatine returned. But they also gave us Rogue One, which is one of the best Star Wars movies since Empire. And they gave us The Mandalorian, which is awesome. And hello, Andor, it's not just some of the best live action Star Wars ever, it's also one of the best TV shows of the last five years. Yeah, I said that. So if they could do great stuff during the Disney era, why weren't Book of Boba Fett and Obi-Wan good? I mean, they're great characters. These should have been great shows. Well, it's because they didn't make it the big day. What the hell am I talking about? Allow me to explain. Believe it or not, I actually went to college for this crap. <laughs> yeah, you could do that. I went to Syracuse University where I majored in writing for television, radio, and film with a dual degree in English. But like most people, I learned a lot more out in the real world. After school, I loaded up my dreamy dream dreams and drove out to California in my Mercury Capri. What a piece of junk. And there I began my meteoric rise in Hollywood. Oh wait, I read that wrong. And there I began my mediocre rise in Hollywood. So I'd written a sci-fi fantasy screenplay, a bunch of comedy sketches, and a few sitcom spec scripts, and I got crappy jobs in the industry doing whatever I could to meet people who I could show my scripts to. People would look at the sci-fi script and say, yeah, this would cost like a trillion dollars to make. But then they'd look at the comedy and say, you know, this stuff actually works. I also realized with comedy I could get a little job here and there. It wasn't the all or nothing game that sci-fi was where you wrote a screenplay and it was a billion to one shot that it would get made. So I focused on comedy. I worked on a show called Later with Greg Kinnear as a production assistant, but they actually used some of the sketches I wrote and then I got jobs writing radio commercials, TV promos, even game show questions. I did a little stand-up here and there, but then I discovered a place called The Groundlings. The Groundlings are a comedy troupe in LA and they have a long list of legendary alumni. The way it worked when I was there was they had four levels, basic, intermediate, writing lab, and advanced. You audition to get into the school and in the first two levels you learn improv and in the last two levels you write and perform a Saturday Night Live style sketch show in front of an audience. After each class, they'd either move you up to the next level or tell you you needed to repeat if you wanted to continue. And some people, they would even say, hey, this just isn't for you. Then after advanced class, a select few would be asked to join the Sunday show. And I went through all four levels without having to repeat. And I went into that advanced class feeling pretty good. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. But then, I was not one of the select few asked to join the Sunday show, but it's okay. I immediately got over it and certainly did not spend the next 20 years dwelling on it. You may be saying, Pileshi, what does sketch comedy have to do with sci-fi shows? Well, comedy and drama are different animals, but they share a lot of the same DNA, kind of like human beings and chimpanzees and lawyers. hi -o. <laughs> And one of the lessons I learned at the Groundlings could explain why Book of Boba Fett and Obi-Wan Kenobi just aren't that good. When someone would bring in a character, one of the tips they would give us is make it the big day or make it a moment when. What that means is you may have a great character with a funny premise, funny voice, funny articulations, but you have to set the sketch in the most interesting moment for the audience to be seeing the character. The big day 
the moment when something incredible happened. To illustrate this concept a little more, let's take a look at a classic Saturday Night Live sketch with comedy legend and Groundling alumni Will Ferrell. I'm talking, of course, about more cowbell. Will Ferrell said he heard Don't Fear the Reaper on the radio, heard the cowbell and thought about who was playing it, and he asked himself, what is that guy's life like? Then he wrote the sketch with friend and playwright Donald Campbell. Now, the premise of a guy in a band whose only instrument is the cowbell is already funny. Throw in some 70s clothes and Will Ferrell's physicality, and this could have been a good sketch. But Will Ferrell knew to make it the big day. The scene takes place the day legendary producer Bruce Dickinson is in the recording studio with Blue Oyster Cult. Hey guys, I put my pants on, just like the rest of you, one leg at a time. Except, once my pants are on, I make gold records. That's a big deal, but it doesn't become the big day until this happens. I'll be honest, fellas, it was sounding great, but I could have used a little more cowbell. <laughs> ah, so the guy who just plays cowbell finally gets the note that they want more cowbell. This gives Will a chance to get bigger and bigger with his character. It adds dramatic tension with his character and Chris Parnell's character and the rest of the band. And eventually, a lifetime of this character's hopes and dreams culminate in this moment. And if Bruce Dickinson wants more cowbell, we should probably give him more cowbell. Say, babe. But the last time I checked, we don't have a whole lot of songs that feature the cowbell. I gotta have more cowbell, baby. But I'd be doing myself a disservice and every member of this band if I didn't perform the hell out of this. So you see, by making it the big day, the sketch was off to the races. It took a good character and made it a great sketch. And of course, having Christopher Walken didn't hurt. Guess what? I got a fever. And the only prescription is more cowbell. The big day works for a five minute comedy sketch, but most TV seasons take a lot longer than that. But we can extrapolate the big day or a moment when over a full length movie, a novel, or an entire TV series. When an author, screenwriter, or playwright write a movie, book, or play, they create a character. And it's their job to figure out what's the most interesting point of this character's life to show to the audience. That's what make it the big day means. Michael Corleone is the youngest son of a mafia Don. He's got a lot going on in his life, but the events of the first Godfather movie are pretty big. As are the events in Godfather Part 2. Godfather Part 3? The aging mobster trying to go legit? Same character, but just not an interesting part of his life. Just when I thought I was out. In the original Star Wars, Luke dreamed of getting off Tatooine. It just isn't fair. Oh, Biggs is right. I'm never gonna get out of here. He dreamed of joining the Rebellion. Oh. You know the Rebellion against the Empire? That's how we came to be in your service, if you take my meaning, sir. So the events of A New Hope can be called the Big Day for Luke. As are the events of Empire. In Book of Boba Fett, Boba Fett is past his prime, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Some characters who are past their prime are still pretty darn interesting. In Top Gun Maverick, Maverick is past his prime, but that's the point. He's still got something to prove, and now he gets a chance for redemption. That's interesting. Rocky Balboa is past his prime, but that's the point. The guy who squandered his talent working as a goon for the mob also gets a shot at redemption. That's interesting. In A Star is Born, Bradley Cooper is so past his prime, he pees himself. Talk about interesting. But the problem with Book of Boba Fett wasn't that Boba Fett was past his prime. It's just that they picked a really uninteresting part of his life to show us. Getting all zen with the Tusken Raiders? Yawn. Watching him try to rule with benevolence? Who cares? This is like Godfather 3 syndrome. In fact, Ming-Na Wen's character Fennec is a way more interesting character than Boba Fett. It's good for a show to have interesting characters besides the lead, but 
you should never wish your main character would disappear so we could see the more interesting characters. Breaking Bad was filled with great characters, but you never forgot that this roller coaster was Walter White's ride. You're goddamn right. The obvious thing to do was to set Book of Boba Fett when he was the galaxy's most feared bounty hunter. And maybe they didn't do that because they thought Mandalorian had already done that. Oh, and by the way, Mando getting the child? Talk about making it the big day. The same goes for Obi-Wan Kenobi. Hello there. The most interesting part of his life were the Clone Wars, and then mentoring Luke and fighting Vader. Pretty darn interesting. But his job during the time frame of the show was to do nothing but to make sure Luke was safe. So any adventure you sent him on took him away from the thing he was supposed to be doing. The very premise of the show made it so anything interesting he did went against the premise of the show. At that point, the minutia didn't even matter. We could talk about why this scene didn't work, or why this scene didn't work, but it doesn't even matter. Story is to a show or book or movie what a foundation is to a house. If the foundation is weak, it doesn't matter what kind of curtains you put on the window. If the story is weak, a great scene is like putting nice curtains on a house that's about to fall down. And fun fact, my dad worked construction and actually laid foundation, so you could kind of say I followed in the old man's footsteps. Although he worked in the sun and the rain, and I work in my pajamas under a blankie with a little dog on my lap, so you know, potato, potato. So yeah, as cool as the scenes with Vader were in Obi-Wan Kenobi, they can't change the structure of the overall show. Hey, you know whose life is really interesting between the events of Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope? Darth Vader. Now that could have been a good show. That, that, it doesn't work for me. I gotta have more cowbell. 